Hello, believers, non-believers, and everyone in between. You're listening to Stories with Sapphire. I am Sapphire Sandalo. Now get cozy and open your mind because it's story time. I am a recurring panelist on a travel channel show called Paranormal Caught on Camera. Back when we were still filming the show in person, we had an awesome makeup artist, Kelly. One day, when we were doing our pre-shoot catch-up as she manipulated my face, I asked if she had ever experienced anything paranormal. We'd been filming the show for three seasons at that point, and I couldn't believe I hadn't asked that already. And she told me that when her son was about two or three, on several occasions, he would cry and sob, saying he missed his mommy. But I'm your mommy, Kelly would comfortingly assure him. I know, he'd reply through sniffles. But I miss my first mommy. This is fairly common. Children around the world have been reported speaking about previous lives. Some children even recall details about what they did for a living and how they died. Some children have even been able to describe a person that actually existed far beyond their lifetime. I find this utterly fascinating. Do these children have wild yet convincing imaginations? Or are they living proof that we can somehow access a time before we were born? That's what we'll be discussing on this week's episode. First, I tell the story of a young woman who believes that she knew her best friend in a previous life. Then, I speak with Chelsea Weber-Smith, a skeptic who had a baffling past life regression meditation. Chapter 1. Soulmates. Submitted by Amanda. Hello, Sapphire. First of all, I just want to say that I'm a very new fan and I love your podcast. I've been going through each episode and I'm absolutely fascinated with everyone's stories. Each episode, I felt compelled to send you mine, but then I'd chicken out. But the more I hold it off, the more I want to send it. So here it is. I wanted to share a story that I like to tell people whenever I talk about the connection between my best friend and myself. I'm super fascinated with past lives and how we connect with certain people in our lives. Sometimes we just have those really special connections that are so profoundly incredible and inexplicable. Are they soulmates? I firmly believe that we don't have just one soulmate, but we can be tethered to many people like a thread. The threads can all be different lengths and types. Soulmates can be best friends, siblings, a random person you've only just met and click with. It doesn't have to be romantic or sexual. It's all about the specific connection. And both people are definitely aware. I'm the third kid out of four girls, the second middle child. So I was always quiet and definitely the tomboy. The son my dad never had, is how my sisters like to phrase it. (laughs) So the story starts around the time I was about three years old. My little sister was born just a few months before my third birthday, so maybe I was being super needy of my mom's attention at the time. But one day, out of the blue, I just had this urge to tell her something that felt very important. She was washing the dishes, and I sat at the kitchen table and suddenly blurted out, Hey mom, I was a boy once. At first she laughed. I was a little tomboy, so she entertained me. Oh yeah? I responded in my tiny voice with all the confidence a three-year-old could muster. Yep, I had a blue car, I crashed it, and I died. My mom said that I just walked away after that. I didn't seem scared or upset about it, just that it was a fact that she needed to know. She didn't ask any more questions, although I truly wish she did. She was speechless. Fast forward to about 10 years later. I met my best friend in high school. I will call her B in this story. She was two years older than me, in my sister's grade. 
and she was absolutely obsessed with obscure British TV shows from the 60s and 70s. And so was I. This was 2003. It was rare to find anyone who even knew about these shows. Nevertheless, absolutely obsessed to the point where she had pictures of them on her notebooks and talked about the actors like they were actually our friends. Super specific stuff that's hard to come by. My sister introduced us, and we got along like a house on fire. We talked on the phone for hours and hours about how we felt about our interests, discovering just how much we had in common. We became so close that our parents thought we were dating, but it was simply just a friendship that really changed both of our lives. It was a bond I never expected to have with anyone before. We were inseparable. We went through so many phases together. The Beatles, The Who, David Bowie. You know, real Anglophile stuff. We would write stories in notebooks and pass them to each other between classes, letting the other finish the line. We always had the best luck at concerts, always somehow meeting the performer. Our passions for things we love always connected us to that very thing, like some kind of weird superpower. It was so freeing to have someone to share my strange thoughts with, things that I couldn't share with my siblings, and for the first time, someone I could be truly vulnerable in front of. I have always had a hard time tapping into my emotions, despite being super sensitive, but it was like... She spoke the spiritual language that I understood entirely. She changed my life and got me onto a better track than where I was heading. My grades improved dramatically and suddenly I knew I had to care about my future and find the thing I wanted to do. She's a true academic in her heart and moved two hours away when she went to college to study art history. I still had two years left of high school, and around the same time, my anxiety and depression started getting really bad, but I didn't know what it was or why it was happening. I think I missed this other half that I had connected to, and what made it even harder was that my older sister also moved up to Minneapolis, so I couldn't bounce anything off her either. I managed to make it through high school and worked hard to get accepted into a private art school in St. Paul and had already planned to move in with B. It was something we talked about for years as teenagers, of course. She was there through my intense and sudden transition into adulthood and all the anxiety I felt during my first year of college. We decorated our apartment with all the stuff we loved. We are huge nerds. Every person I dated in college was totally intimidated by her, too. Like, they could never hold a candle to the connection that me and B had. And I mean, they were totally right. Fast forward to my final year of college. I was swept off my feet by a British fella I had met through MySpace years prior. I basically took up an internship in London as a cheeky excuse to stay in his house. I also fell in love with the city of London and wanted to move there to be with him. It was all I talked about. I was so happy and I was so ready to move there, so my boyfriend and I became engaged. I was surprised to find out that B was not happy. She was so upset, so wild with intense dread that it nearly tore our friendship apart. Most people figured it was jealousy, but it wasn't that to me. It was pure sadness, heartbreak. She was scared I was going to leave her and forget about her to start a new life. As much as I assured her that I would never, ever forget her, she couldn't let it go. It tore me up to get such a strong reaction from someone I considered my best friend. We had terrible fights, crying matches, door slamming. We just weren't on the same page. Around the same time, there was a day where I was at work, just listening to the radio and washing dishes. The name Albert suddenly popped into my head. I didn't know why, and I didn't question it. I just shrugged it off like, huh. I like that name, and just continued my job. When I got home from work, I got a call from B. She was in our hometown visiting her folks for the weekend. The first question she asked me was, Hey, um, does the name Albert mean anything to you? I froze. I 
think I may have even gasped. I literally knew nobody named Albert. There was nobody in my family or her family with that name. The closest I've ever gotten to that name is that AL are my initials, but that's it. I laughed, stunned. You know what's really weird? I was just thinking about that name today at work. It just popped into my head, I told her. What the hell? Okay, you gotta listen to this. She proceeded to tell me that she was visiting a shop in our hometown that sold mystical stuff like incense, crystals, pendulums, tarot cards, and all that. The owner approached her with concern, sensing that there was something wrong, and asked her what was on her mind. B simply just said that she was sad that her best friend was going to move away without her. The woman didn't get much detail after that and offered her a psychic reading. She told B, You're still mourning a loss from a past life. Your husband, he died young. He was a daredevil and a bootlegger. His name was Albert and you were Genevieve. B was stunned, wondered briefly if this lady was nuts or if she was crazy herself. I remember B's voice on the phone telling me with excitement as she knew what she was about to say would blow me away. And get this. She told me that you had a blue car, that you crashed it, and died. B knew the story about what I told my mom when I was three and didn't say anything about it to the psychic. I think we just laughed in amazement, not even knowing what to say. But the more we thought about it, the more it made sense. I mean, this woman could have just been spitting some wild tale to make her feel better, but... Albert? A blue car? I crashed it and I died? It was so perplexing. I still get chills thinking about it to this day. I ended up not moving to London and breaking up with my fiancé. I had a breakdown that lasted for about a year after my breakup, but she was 100% there for me. B had shared with me that she was going to move to Paris to study film and get her master's degree. I remember feeling many different emotions. At first, I was terrified of what my life would be like without her. But then I realized it wasn't about me at all. I wanted her to find something she could be passionate about, and why would I try to deny that for her? When she moved, I didn't feel the same way that she did when I wanted to move to London. This was different. Of course, at first, I was truly sad to not live with her anymore and having to figure it all out on my own, but I trusted that she would thrive. And now, I can visit her in Paris. We still get into our little obsessions and talk about it for hours, laugh so hard we cry, quote random bits from our favorite shows and movies. We even joke about our past life marriage sometimes. While our friendship has been entirely platonic, I still find it quite romantic how past lives can surpass time and adapt into different people. Even if the entire story told by the psychic was all just a ruse, it still really helped to ground us and understand that we never really leave each other and the love is always there. We will always follow each other, wherever, whatever, whenever. I can't remember where I first heard this idea, but there's a theory that when we are reincarnated, we tend to be surrounded by the same group of souls. But each lifetime, our roles might be different. So for example, my sister was once told that in a past life, her current daughter was her mother. And in another life, she was a princess and her husband now was her servant. These are the people that you feel like you've known longer than you've been alive. And that's what came to mind when reading Amanda's story. It sounds like in a previous life, and a fairly recent one, they were Albert and Genevieve, a married couple whose relationship ended abruptly when Albert died. And now in this life, Amanda and Bea were best friends. What I like about this theory is that it kind of feels like a cosmic experiment. The pieces keep rearranging to eventually find the perfect combination. Or maybe just to have all the pieces experience life from various perspectives. 
Amanda, I hope everything with B is still wonderful and that you're able to continue to encourage each other to grow in this life and the next. Chapter 2. Solomon J. Solomon. <clears throat> All right. My name is Chelsea Weber-Smith, and I'm from Seattle, Washington. I was introduced to Chelsea when I interviewed them for my previous podcast. I remember being a little nervous because their show, American Hysteria, which is fantastic, by the way, and you should definitely check it out, is very skeptical, and I was worried they would think I was a little bit of a weirdo. But we had such a fun time and have kept in touch ever since. We connected over how our individual shows were a clear representation of who we are as people. And while Stories with Sapphire has given me a stronger relationship with the spirit world, American Hysteria has done the opposite for Chelsea. I used to be very much what I call a fantastical thinker, and um, I had all kinds of spiritual beliefs, and I got into probably every <laughs> kind of of spiritual pathway you could get into, you know, everything from Sufism to the Akashic Records to uh, you name it, and I probably had some involvement in doing it. And Right now, my relationship to the spiritual world feels really cut off, and um, that partially happened when I experienced um, my grandpa dying, and he was kind of my favorite, favorite person, and he died, and I was there, and I think kind of seeing death was such a new experience for me, and it, it affected me. I think it can affect people in, multiple, in many different ways, but for me, it was uh, combined with starting to make this show and also coming out of years of being a conspiracy theorist, not a QAnon one, but more of like a uh, 2012 conspiracy theorist, but there's a lot of similarities. So I've been sort of trying to come back to some kind of, of faith. And part of that for me has been the recognition of, of what am I looking for? You know, it used to be truth. I've thrown that out. <laughs> I don't think I'm ever going to find that. So now I think it's just finding that, that space, um, you know, I mean, I guess call it being or or something where all of the stories are gone, all of the, the identities around yourself, all of the politics, all of your past and your future, and just kind of being able to, to wash all of that away and just feel that sort of like being a pure human. Despite being a skeptical and rational person, there is one peculiar incident that Chelsea has never been able to explain. It was back around the year 2012, before American Hysteria, when Chelsea was still in their own words, a fantastical thinker. So I was on a three or four month road trip and I used to do this all the time. I used to hitchhike a lot and then when I was too tired to do that anymore, I uh, got a truck and I've traveled and lived in my truck a lot and it, it's all set up in the back as a bed and everything. So I uh, used to do that quite a bit, which as you may imagine, led me to some very interesting situations. I went to this town called Sandpoint, Idaho, and I was actually going to see somebody I hadn't seen forever, which was my dad's girlfriend that I just absolutely loved. They got in a fight. She disappeared forever when I was a kid, maybe 11, never saw her again. So I showed up in this town knowing she lived there and I just started asking people at the coffee shop, do you know this person? And the first person I asked was like, oh yeah, I know her. And, and by that night we were having pizza and I was spending the night at her house. So it was a beautiful, you know, it was a really nice uh, point in my life because it felt like things were aligning and things were feeling beautiful and uh, connected. So anyway, in that same coffee shop, this very new age woman started talking to me who was with the person who was helping me find this woman. And she said, you know, I talked about what I was doing and what I was interested in and kind of how I was on this uh, spiritual journey, which is always what my travels were. And she said, you have got to go see Shaman Ziggy. <laughs> I was like, I guess I do have to go see Shaman Ziggy. Um, if somebody says you have to go see Shaman Ziggy, you have to go. And so she gave me directions out to this like intentional community out in in the boonies. So I went and and found, you know, I had like a little 
she drew on like a piece of paper where to find him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was like, look for the yellow school bus that's been converted into a house. So I, I found it and um, I met him and he told me a lot all about his past life experiences, which were very detailed and very complicated. But anyway, so my time with him gets weirder and weirder, um, you know, and suddenly I'm like, Chelsea, you don't actually go when someone <laughs> says go see Shaman Siki. You're wrong. Um, but we're hanging out and he's like, all right, so, you know, you're interested in past life regression stuff. And, and I was then. You know, I believed in past lives. And also I grew up, my stepmom is indigenous. She, uh, so she grew up with like a very, very spiritual part of her life um, that was based in her particular tribal spirituality. So when I was a kid, I heard all these just amazing stories of her remembering past lives and being sort of like taken over by these past lives and these voices that would bring her to certain places where she would live out these experiences of being, you know, a young native man, all different kinds of things. Even my my step grandma is a past life uh, regression hypnotherapist. Um, so my relationship to all that now is, you know, probably more skeptical, but also I don't know anything. <laughs> That's where I always go back to. I'm an agnostic in every way. Um, so I laid on the ground and he brought me sort of back through my life. And he he told me each year to picture myself getting younger and younger and to, of course, like completely relax and all that stuff. And with Shaman Ziggy, I was not relaxed. <laughs> I did not have a, any experience there except trying to just uh, look like I was having some kind of experience because I just was so uncomfortable. Anyway, we went for this long walk and talked. And, and then I was like, I'm out of here. You know, thank you for teaching me about this. So then I just started doing it on my own because I knew I would feel able to get to a meditative place um, by myself that I wouldn't have with a strange hippie. So I just started doing this kind of daily. Another thing he taught me was when you're um, trying to get because you're trying to get, you know, allegedly sort of to like a deeper part of your subconscious, I guess. So when you're meditating, that's sort of what you're doing. You're like relaxing until you're in like a more mindful or mindless place and you can do it to yourself. And, and basically, what he said and what I also had read at the time was to picture yourself walking down a staircase and to picture it in every like possible detail, not imagine it so much as like see what pops up. Like that's a lot of what this is, is like trusting your subconscious images rather than, oh, I'm going to imagine my staircase. You just like go in and just see what pops up. Right. And so for me, my staircase was sort of like a dirt hole, you know, like almost like you're going down to some kind of wine cellar, right? I don't know why. So that's what it looked like. So you step down and with each step, you know, you're supposed to breathe and let more go and let more go and just try to go deeper and deeper into the self. And then um, once you reach the bottom of the stairs, you're supposed to look out and see what you see. And then you're sort of in that realm where you can be accessed by your past lives or maybe other spiritual beings. So um, so what happened for me that I've never been able to forget and I've never reconciled with my skeptical side or anything like that. And I will say memory is very fallible. We can remember many things that never happened, but I really believe that I remember this accurately and the story has never exaggerated. So I, I was doing the thing, I got, I got deep and uh, <clears throat> I walked into the world after the staircase thing and I was very, very much in some, some deeper level, whatever that means. And suddenly I saw a man and he was crouched down and covered in camouflage netting. You probably know what that looks like. Um, if you're a soldier and you're hiding in the jungle, you're wearing this camouflage netting and he kind of had like dirt on his face. You know, he was just sitting there, just staring at me, very intense stare. It was very unnerving. But 
I was able to sort of do this thing where I was like, okay, I can see that he's wearing dog tags. And so I was like, okay, look at those, like find out his name, look at them. Because it's a very, like if you're trying to lucid dream, any moment could screw it up. Like if you think too hard, you'll come out of it. So you have to be like really almost like really careful. So I, I kind of reached, I mean, I reached out with my mind and the dog tags kind of appeared in front of me. And the name was Jay Solomon. And I was like, okay, that's that's a name, right? I didn't make that up. That's a name that came to me. So I try to speak to this person and then everything gets all garbled up and crazy. And then I come out of it and I was like, okay, that's it. So I was like, okay, that was, that was something. That was weird, right? And so I go to Google. I type it into Google and it comes up. The very first result is a painter whose name is Solomon J. Solomon and... He is most famous for inventing camouflage netting. <laughs> it is so unexplainable. I've never heard of this man. He's not famous, but and ah, it's so weird. And it's not that sensational of a story. It doesn't change. It's just like I, I knew this man's name and I saw him there and he was covered in camouflage netting. Chelsea was laying down alone in a room doing nothing but thinking, and was able to pull information about a real living person in history out of nowhere. And that was it. And I, you know, I told my stepmom about it and she, you know, she was like, did you recognize it as yourself? When you saw this person, was there this like, that's me? And I said, no, I didn't feel like me. And then she said, I think it's your dad. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, And he had a very, my dad's very intense and he has a very intense eyes. and, And I could really feel that that could be true in the world in which things are true. That could be, that could be true. And the next time I was able to get to that place, I was able to see him again. And as I was walking down the stairs, this time there was a book pressed into the wall. And so I pulled it down, it was like this big old book. And I went down and I saw him again and I handed him the book and he opened it and like held it out so I could see the words, maybe the way like a librarian shows a picture when she's reading to kids. And he was pointing at something like so intensely, like, like you need to read this right now and read it and read it. And it was so overwhelming that I came out of it and I never, I never saw him again. So I have no idea what the <laughs> very urgent message to me was. So uh, that's my, uh, that's my big experience with past life uh, regression and uh, I I have no way to explain it and uh, I just let it be and I think it's really cool I think it's a cool story and I enjoy I enjoy having certain mysteries that that keep me skeptical of my skepticism Past life regression therapy is controversial in the psychology field. We can't prove the existence of past lives, so claiming to guide someone through theirs seems deceitful. But in Chelsea's case, there was no transaction, just them alone traveling into their own subconscious. There are many people who would pay large amounts of money to have an experience like Chelsea did, and plenty of people who would take advantage of them. I think it's a real shame that so many ancient practices that we can achieve on our own for our benefit have become commodified. It makes reality even blurrier than it already is. Uh, We covered urban legends in our final episode, and it was really about my journey through learning what an urban legend was since I was a little kid, scary stories to tell in the dark, up through now. And uh, at the end of that and at the end of our season, which has been so much about propaganda from both sides of the political spectrum, from psychotherapy propaganda, all kinds of stuff that, that create our reality for us, and that reality has become very lucrative for a lot of people. And for me, I'm trying to remember that there's a difference between spreading a legend and spreading a lie. And one person truly believes they're spreading a truth and they're not gaining financially from spreading that. They're not, they're, they're just trying to understand this chaotic experience. And so I think for me, I just like, there's a difference between a legend and a lie. And there's a difference between believing in something genuinely and manipulating people's beliefs. And I think that that's a very particular kind of darkness that someone contains. 
I always encourage listeners to open their minds and believe, but it's also important to have a healthy amount of skepticism. If you'd like to hone those skills and look at influential moments in history through a new lens, check out American Hysteria wherever you listen to podcasts. In the season three premiere of the show, I spoke with Nita Gunkaiko, one of my favorite guests on my personal favorite episode. She has a unique perspective on the supernatural as a trained medical doctor and a powerful medium. And after I recorded her interview, she gave me a reading. I've had plenty of readings before, but Nita was spot on. Everything she was saying resonated with me. I was very much all in on team Nita. Until she said, Oh, you're a very new soul. I paused. She spoke with such certainty. I asked, hesitantly, What does that mean? You haven't had that many lives. You're, you're still young. My initial reaction was kind of offended, and thoughts started racing through my head. Is she calling me immature? I usually get the opposite from people, that I'm an old soul. Maybe this woman doesn't know anything after all. It really threw me for a loop. Long after I left her house, I couldn't stop thinking about what she said. And eventually, it clicked. I'm a huge scaredy cat. Heights, small spaces, the dark, the ocean, going fast in any vehicle, crowds, basically any situation where I immediately start counting the many different ways I could possibly die. And these fears prevent me from taking part in a lot of activities, which in turn causes some friends and family to get annoyed with me, and then I get mad at myself for not being braver. It makes sense to me that a soul that hasn't transitioned through death that many times would be so afraid all the time. And I think that's what Nita meant when she said I was a new soul. My soul is still very inexperienced. The fact that I was offended she would imply that I was immature is proof that I am still immature and have a lot of growing to do. And thinking of my soul in this way allows me to be a little bit more gentle with myself and to respect my boundaries. I don't think we'll ever know definitively if past lives are real or not, but if believing in them and learning about yours motivates you to live your best life right now, then why not explore it? 